Now, next, almost a decade ago, a young woman from West Belfast decided to go public with allegations of sexual abuse. Her name was Maria Cahill. The award-winning BBC Spotlight documentary, A Woman Alone with the IRA, investigated the Republican movement's handling of sexual abuse allegations against a suspected IRA member who's always denied the claims. She's written about her experiences in the new book. I asked her how close she was to the Republican movement when she was growing up. I was very connected. I mean, I was the first ever elected national secretary, albeit I didn't even know I was standing for election. I come from a Republican extended family. My great uncle Joe was the chief of staff at one point of the IRA. My grandfather was interned three times. You know, I had uncles who were on the run. I had uncles who were in jail. My cousin Siobhan O'Hannon, who was Jerry Adams' secretary, was arrested for being part of a bomb factory. And then we later found out after she died, she was one of the Gibraltar bombers. So, you know, it was a family very much steeped in republicanism. And I volunteered um, both within Sinn Féin and also within a local community radio station, you know, from a very young age. And look, I enjoyed it. The crack was mighty at times, you know, the huge amount of energy around things like that. And I'm a politics nerd, as you know. So, you know, it was a, a place where I enjoyed being and then the abuse happened and I think everything was changed irrevocably, you know. I met Owen O'Brien, who is a fantastically energetic man. He's now a TD within Sinn Féin, very, very intelligent. And he asked me to come along to a few Sinn Féin youth meetings and that's where I went. And before long, one became another and another and I was being treated like an adult, you know, so, and that, I was articulate at that time. Um, but I probably wasn't fully formed as a, as a 16 year old even. Never mind, and I mean this mentally, never mind anything else. And, you know, my life was changed. I just turned 16, sorry, in May of 1997. And the sexual abuse then that I was subjected to started in July, um, the end of July, start of August 1997. Where did it first start? It started in a sofa in the house next door to my grandmother and in, in my father's sister's house. And the man who was alleged to have abused me, I think it's probably important that I say he denied it and was found not guilty later, um, had asked me to take, you know, had, had handed me a tin of harp and I didn't want to drink it. And he said, oh, it's OK, I'll sort it out. So I drank, you know, probably three half tins because I was trying to keep up. And then I fell asleep, it was groggy. Um, and I woke up, kept my eyes shut. And that was one of the features of my abuse that I pretended to be sleeping throughout it because I was so afraid of um, probably in a split second moment in my head I was afraid of what would happen, but I was also acutely embarrassed um, by it. And I, I, even to the point where I didn't want my abuser to know that I was awake during it, because then I would have to face the fact that he knew what he was doing. And I, you know, I explain this all the time. If anybody wants a window into how insidious abuse can be, that mental tussle, you know, which I describe in the book, um, I think for me is it. That explains it. Yeah. And would he ever speak to you afterwards about it? Well, the very first mo morning, actually, so what happened with the first incident was he eventually went off up the stairs and I went, there was a downstairs bathroom. And that was my second mistake, if you like. I went in and I immediately washed. I wanted to wash his semen off my stomach. I wanted to get, get him away. Um, and the, the next morning he came down and booted me in the back um, and told me to make him a cup of coffee. And that was a huge regret of mine still to this day that I got up and made him a cup of coffee as if nothing had happened. I think it shows the nature of, of how damaging abuse can be, that you're, you're going from one day to the next, you're existing, but you also have this family unit in which everything is, on an outward appearance anyway, happy. And I, my grandmother was very, very important to me, as was um, my father's side of the family, so... Sorry, I, I actually wasn't expecting to become upset because I'm so used to talking about this issue, but sometimes... So you just, come across as yeah. strong, and you are strong, but what I'm trying to get here is the, the pain that is within you about this. Yeah. You can be strong and it's still hurting, right? Oh, look, I think it probably always will. So this is eating inside you. Life is going on. What happened next? I found it hard to cope. I actually disclosed the abuse fairly early on. And, and, you know, some people keep it hidden for 30, 40, 50 years. Mine was probably a number of months. And I told three women who I trusted on separate occasions, more so because I needed to speak about it. it was, I needed to spew it out. Um, and I told Siobhan O'Hannon and I told two other women. 
and one of those women went to the IRA. The IRA inexplicably, for some reason, decided to wait for a period of around a year and then they came to me. So I think there's always a misconception out there that I reported this to the IRA. I, didn't. I had no idea that they had this information and I was completely gobsmacked when I found out then that they, they did. And I found out because they came and told me that I had to come and meet them that evening and um, they told me I'd made an allegation or they'd heard I'd made an allegation against this man and that they were going to investigate it and that he had rights as a volunteer. Um, and that How did really, that feel? Well, I felt like, again, like a rag doll, but in a very different set of circumstances. Um, I felt that my life was not my own and that I wasn't in control of it. Where were you ordered to go to? I was told to go to a flat in Andersonstown um, to meet... Well, actually, I wasn't told originally what... They wanted to speak about I asked, so I, just to explain, it's in the book, but I, I was in um, the Sinn Féin Centre when a woman came in and told me that we, meaning the IRA, need to see you tonight. And I asked what it was about and she wouldn't tell me, and in fact didn't tell me until later on that evening when I was sitting facing her and another member in a, a kitchen in a flat, an upstairs flat in Anderson's Town. She had gone to this house not knowing... Didn't have a clue. I, I was racing through my head, so I was, again, I've written about this. I was trying to work out what this potentially could be about. And I think everybody, you know, if you're, you're faced with a situation where somebody says, we need to see you, you know, even if it wasn't the IRA, you'd be kind of thinking, what do they want? Um, and I thought, and this sounds ridiculous now, but I think a lot of people who come from the area that I come from will know this. You know, even if you grow up in an area which supports the IRA and, you know, I didn't, I, I grew up in, in Stockmans in Anderson's Town, but, you know, I went to Bella Murphy at the weekends where the majority of people did. When they come looking for you as a unit, it's a very, very different thing. When you're the focus of their attention, it's a very scary place to be in, even if your uncle was the chief of staff at one point of the organisation. Were you um, frightened? I, oh, God, absolutely. I thought I was going to be killed to the extent where I actually wrote a note and left it under my pillow in the house. And I said, you know, I wrote it to my mum and said, the IRA have done this, ask such and such who it is. And when I walked out down the stairs... She left a note under yep. your pillow, yep. essentially saying goodbye to yep. your mum. Yeah, very, very briefly, you know. And I left and I walked up the street and the, the very first page of the book deals with that walk as I'm, I'm going up the street to meet this woman. And I get into the car, you know, and there was you know, pop music on the radio. The, there was an air freshener in the car that was making me feel a bit nauseous. And I was starting to really, you know, panic. And when I panic, I go intensely calm then. So, you know, I could feel this process happening without even knowing that it was a process. And then when I get into the flat, um, she introduced herself. She couldn't Just picture the scene yeah. for me. Just help describe well, the scene. Well, when you went into this particular flat at that time, there was a living room off to the left and a kitchen off to the right and a, a small kitchen and a window. So I, I was sitting here and there was a table here and she sat directly facing me here and uh, the man stood in the um, door frame with his arms folded. So even if I had wanted to get out, you know, there was nowhere to go really. Um, she put the kettle on and I could see the smoke billowing across underneath, you know, where the, the countertop is, where it, because the kettle's underneath the cupboard, you can see it kind of ghostly, like almost going across. And I thought in my frightened state, they're gonna pour boiling water over me. You know, I'd seen the stories of people being abducted and, you know, all of the rest of it. And she made a cup of tea, you know, and so, Th that's how frightened I was, you know, everything became a weapon in that room at that point in time and I was kind of looking around and, you know, she was softly spoken so that then unnerved me further. She sat down and tried to introduce herself as being there from Oakley and Heron. She couldn't say it properly so she gave up and just said the army, you know, we're here from the army. And they told me that he had rights as a volunteer and that they were going to investigate it and at that point I went, where has this come from, you know? And I was then trying, I think I, I became... Again, part of this problem, not of my making, but I was then trying to outsmart the IRA in my head, you know, because I was trying to stay alive. So this survival kind of thing kicked in where uh, after the first time of meeting them and then they brought another woman in, I had to then keep going to these meetings, if you like. Um, one of the things which I did was I became monosyllabic at a time. You know, like I, people normally find it very hard to shut me up. <laughs> you know, I couldn't speak. And I, I thought that if I didn't speak then and I didn't give them, you know, all of the information that they were looking for, it, it would keep me alive for a wee bit longer. When they were questioning you, did you have any sense that they were trying to get to the truth? No, I don't think so. I think what now were they looking, saying? 
Well, they were all different things. I mean, they were, I, I remember about different meetings. So, you know, I was asked about the details of my abuse. Very embarrassing for an 18-year-old to try and um, recount to anybody. But they recount the individuals who said they were there from the IRA, you know, a million times worse. Um, I then wrote down three very brief incidents, if you like, which they then took and used as a... Uh, I had written them down because I couldn't verbalise it. They then took it in as and referred to them as written statements. So they were inching towards um, holding this kangaroo court, if you like, around it. And even to the point of where they brought him in their room to face me, like they were telling me things like, you know, we can sometimes read people's body language and see who's telling the truth. You know, again, sounds ridiculous now. Then at the time, it's, you know, I didn't know. I'd never been in an IRA investigation. I hadn't asked for it, so I didn't know what the hell was going on or, or who could read what, you know. So uh, there were other things, like there was another woman who's now dead, and she was very gruff. So she was an elderly woman, probably at that stage, maybe in her late 60s. Um, you know, and she would bark things at, you know. There were times where a male would come in and say, do you not want to withdraw your allegation? Are you sure you don't want to withdraw your allegation? I was saying, you know, after all this time, like, could you just not kind of just realise that I actually am telling the truth? And this woman who had been with, from the very first meeting, had been there from the IRA, came into the room and she had a black leather jacket on. She put her arms around me and said, you know, no one would let this go on as long as it did if it wasn't true. And that was the first indicator for me that someone within that unit believed me. But up until that point, and certainly after it, um, I felt very much that you were under pressure to try to prove to people that it was true, and how do you do that when, when it's an abuse case and it's in the shadows? Um, and secondly, that I felt that their interest was in protecting their organisation rather than in being anywhere interested in the case of child abuse. I felt it was a damage limitation exercise. Certainly from looking back over it, the length of time, the uh, focus of the meetings, the fact that this man eventually disappeared out of the jurisdiction, uh, the fact that when it went to court, people didn't admit their roles in it, that it was denied, that I was allowed to be kicked around, you know, in the public arena, that there was certainly briefing that went on within journalistic circles, you know, she's not, there's something not right there with her, you know, she definitely was abused, but we're not sure what else went on. You know, the fact that the Sinn Féin party then said, oh, we believe she was abused, but refused to say they believed there was an IRA investigation. All of that, I think, um, certainly contributed. And you can see now, looking back, that the institution, like many institutions, was certainly more important than a child abuse case. And that, for me, was probably one of the most despicable aspects and certainly very hard to deal with. You know. Take me back to the point where you're confronted by your abuser. Um, I was lifted from a place and put into the back of a car. Two women were driving. I had a carton of soupy orange and spilt it down the front of myself because I was a bundle of nerves. This, remember, I had pretended to be asleep during the abuse. This was the first time that and look, and that naively I believed, probably for some point, that he believed that I was sleeping. So this was the first time that I was going to have to face this individual with my eyes open and his eyes open, and that he knew um, that I was telling people what he had done. So that was very, very damaging for me, and under no circumstances would I ever recommend putting an abuse victim face to face with an abuser. I just wouldn't. I think it was, uh, still to this day, I have nightmares about it. It was horrendous. When I sat down and again... Was it like this? Was it, was it as close uh, yeah, as this? You, it was as close. It was a very small living room. So I was sitting here to the left-hand side of me was a woman with a notebook and a pen. And then these foot, I could hear these footsteps coming up the stairs and in walked um, an IRA man with my abuser and they sat over there. There was like a wee fireplace just facing and a, a seat over here. And he sat on the seat and the other guy sat on the ground and he joked about having smelly feet, you know. It's like a, a, almost in a sick way to try to lighten the mood. Um, and then this thing happened, this kind of, I was going to say to and fro, and it actually wasn't. Um, this man was allowed to shout, um, you know, you're a liar, you're a sick effer, you know, you're right up to the Black Mountain, you're saying I did this, how could I do this with my wife in the house? And I remember it was the one time when he said that, I said to him, and that's what makes you a bastard. And I, the woman to the left hand side of me put down the pen and kind of looked, you know, and someone actually remarked to me afterwards, you know, when I was telling them about this experience, you know, they were quite happy to let him curse at you. But the minute that you used the, the B word, everybody stopped, you know. 
And that, like, I have no way of knowing really how long that happened. I know it was dark. It was light when I went into that place. It was dark when I left. Um, and I was sick. I got the, an IRA woman took me into a car to leave me down the road and I asked her to stop the car and I opened the door and was sick out onto the street. And the Sinn Féin party have yet to admit what their view is on it or whether it took place. And uh, I hear very often statements which say, we don't know, we don't know whether it happened because the IRA have left the stage. But in actual fact, the people who were in the room with me, one's now dead. There are two other alive people who can corroborate that account. And there are other people on the periphery who can also corroborate it. And no one has ever done so. And I think at the very least I'm owed that um, after what they put me through. You know. It's a big decision to take on the machine. Mm -hmm. It's a big decision to take on the IRA. It's a big decision to take on Sinn Féin. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I mean, it's textbook how not to treat rape victims in public. I think if you go to any, you know, social media channel you can see exactly how I was treated at the point of going public. I had a fair few amount of death threats after I went public. I had a fair few people who came. I had an insidious campaign of abuse directed at me which looked to be coordinated. And there were a coordinated network of accounts and I could see this playing out in real time as could everybody else see it. You know there were fake accounts set up in my name and in actual fact the same thing has happened this week again since the book came out. I had bot accounts flying at me like no other. Um, and I do had you people... believe that was coordinated by who? I think it was very clear. It was, it was coordinated by Republicans, certainly it was clear. The IRA as this army, do you believe that the leadership of the IRA, do you believe they cared more about victims of sex abuse or the good name of the IRA? I don't think they gave a fiddlers about any sex abuse victim. Um, I think they gave absolutely everything in terms of protecting the IRA and its reputation and its advance, the Republican movement's advance towards electoral politics. If there was a case that could have potentially caused embarrassment to the Republican movement, a perpetrator was simply moved in out of the jurisdiction or to another town or city um, without any checks or balances on them and that that was the problem forgotten about or swept off, you know, as far as the IRA were concerned. And we're looking at a situation in Northern Ireland where the Republican machine and Sinn Féin, different people in that party now, um, you know, who knows, we could have a United Ireland in a few years' time. Um, uh, at the moment, with the amount of votes they have, Michelle O'Neill, who was not involved, First Minister, but within Sinn Féin. And Sinn Féin positioning themselves as a party for all. Are they a change party? Are you prepared to, to look at the possibility that there's a young generation that knows nothing about the IRA, that sh sees Sinn Féin as a legitimate, honourable political party? I think you judge people and how they act towards you. And I'm not seeing any sense of change in terms of how the Sinn Féin party have treated me over the last uh, certainly 10 years. You know, I mean, uh, it'll be nine years I think in October, um, where I waived anonymity fully as an abuse victim. But if you count way back, it's 26 years, I think, or 27 since I was abused. So almost all of my life, you know, and certainly the majority of my life, I've been treated pretty badly by some Republicans. And I think that the spokespeople within Sinn Féin really need to search their souls in this issue. I think they should read the book. I think they probably have read the book. Um, but I think that they should certainly respond to it in, in a way in which demonstrates that they can finally treat people with care. Who's in government doesn't really concern me. Look, I've lived in a, a, a state that has been governed by Sinn Féin for the most part since 1998 in some shape or form. Don't happen to partic particularly think it's been very good government, you know, for the person on the ground, but they, you know, they've been there. So in very many ways, it doesn't really, it's irrelevant to me who votes for them or how powerful they are in terms of votes or whatever else. Here's what matters to me. It matters to me that my personal integrity on this issue um, is intact. And it matters to me that people read this book and they can see from A to Z, you know, exactly what happened. And it very much matters to me if you're in a position of power or influence that you actually um, allow yourself to be held accountable in relation to the issue in the round. So 
while Michelle O'Neill and Mary Lou Macdonald may not have been there at the time, they're now the figureheads for an, a, you know, a political party and that political party has questions to answer on this issue. And I think they've dodged them, you know, successfully with a very successful press um, office behind them. And woman to woman, mm -hmm. what do you say to Michelle O'Neill and Mary Lou Macdonald? Well, I think that I think you should treat the issue of abuse with kid gloves when it, it rears its head. And I don't think that you can subjectively say, I believe someone was abused, but I'm not going to say she was abused by the IRA because there were two elements of abuse in my story, remember. One, the physical sexual abuse, and two, the further abuse and re-traumatisation by an IRA investigation. And that's the part that Michelle O'Neill and Mary Lou Macdonald, even though they were never in the IRA, even though they were not connected with the people who conducted that IRA investigation, those people are still on the periphery of Sinn Féin. And it is so easy within Republican circles, and everybody will know this, to find out what happened. And I hope that um, when the party reads it, and I, you know, I presume that they will, that they have a level of embarrassment about the way in which they have treated me to date. Maria, thank you for talking to me. Thank you, appreciate it. It's a big interview. Sinn Féin have been in touch with The Nolan Show. They've said the abuse that Maria Cahill suffered was horrific. They've said Republicans were not and are not equipped to deal with abuse allegations. Mary Lou Macdonald met with Maria Cahill and apologised directly to her. She has reiterated that apology numerous times since. What happened in the 1990s would not happen today. Not one mention in this Sinn Féin statement about the IRA. Do you believe Maria Cahill Sinn Féin when she talks about being interrogated by the IRA, when she talks about an IRA abuser, an alleged abuser sitting opposite her, or do you not believe her? Which is it?